Hi, good morning and welcome everyone. This is Seek Sustainable Japan. And in this episode, we are talking about natural dyes, aizome, traditional Japanese techniques to reuse old clothes and to do workshops as well as running a shop in the Kansai area. Thanks so much for joining, Sally. Uh, thank you for having me. It's, uh, it's yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Great to have you. Now, I think ages ago, I talked to somebody who's in Shikoku. Uh, she's she's doing uh, like Aizome natural indigo dyeing as well. Um, you're in the Hyogo area, are you? Yeah, but we're really close. I know Hanga too. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, Awaji Island at the moment, it's part of Hyogo Prefecture, but historically it was part of Tokushima Prefecture. Oh, yeah, yeah. Wild. Uh, but that area, I heard, uh, maybe your area as well, traditionally was where a lot of indigo would be grown. Is yeah, right? yeah. Tokushima is the famous place. And um, yeah, I think there's no, um, Awaji Island, it's not really, there's no, there's no farmers that are left over from, um, in the same way they are in Tokushima. But I mean, uh, all over Japan, there used to be dyers and growers and merchants of indigo so i mean uh the name uh, konyamachi you can have konyamachi in many towns like around japan and that's like dark blue dyeing place so. nice i've actually met some like commercial industries which use indigo dye and i'm always disappointed if they're not using indigo from japan but they always say there's not enough so some of the traditions of growing they say has gone down or it's not quick enough and i'm a huge fan of natural indigo because it's so sustainable from the way you grow it until the wastewater going back to nature it's a very non-toxic experience. So it's something we need to do more of. So I'm so happy to find you. You're doing so much great work. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think that might be um, part of the way, like traditional Japanese indigo is fermented in a way that it can make a dye bath. But if you're trying to extract the pigment to like use for other purposes, it's a slightly different process, I think. Yeah, maybe. Maybe uh, we need to change back. We have so many great solutions from the past. We just need to find out ways to incorporate them into our future and present, right? Yeah. Uh, just to give people a little bit of background here before we start. Uh, so Sally, you and your partner run the business II. Yes. You're based in Awaji Island in Hyogo, Japan, which is Kansai area. And you have a background in uh illustration and design from the uk and how did you get interested when when was the spark for you for natural um, dyeing i guess i've always been interested in um tie tie dye in general like since forever um and then uh japan has its quite kind of un yeah has its own unique very developed form of tie dye which is shibori which I think recently is getting, is kind of having a bit of a boom around the world. And um, I guess I wanted to know, about eight years ago, I wanted to know like more of the complex patterns, like how, how do they make those more complex patterns? And um, so we just, me and my partner got a book and with illustrated with the photos and just like started trying to make these patterns and at that time we were using um chemical dye but gradually like because the the natural dye seemed kind of um too difficult <laughs> basically it was too hard too expensive um at first but um gradually we learned more about it and now yeah we're doing uh, natural dye and then I thought like oh we'll just buy it but then it's quite difficult to buy so now I'm actually a farmer as well which is a surprise for anyone who would know me from the past that I became a farmer. <laughs> That's amazing and when I talked to Hanga too mm. uh, about what she's doing 
Uh, she was also saying there's just not enough indigo if you want to do it. So <laughs> growing your own, let's talk about growing your own from seed. Uh, this from Instagram here. Yeah. Uh, you're talking about your seed. Does it re-sprout every year or you have to replant every oh, year? Oh, yeah. Um, we, yeah, we plant them and uh, we harvest seeds and sprinkle them and then replant them when they are... Um, about this big <laughs> and so the ones on that field in that photo is uh they just came up naturally but we just plowed them back into the into the earth that like you make a lot of seeds with a field our size of indigo that we we don't need all of those um seeds yeah you sell the seeds as well um uh, we <laughs> we have done in the past but i mean it's just for like uh it's hard. Yeah, no. hard. It might be hard to grow uh, for yourself, but, but uh, it's here's... Not hard to grow. Oh, really? Um, yeah. Just um, like a lot of Japanese people don't have land to, I mean, they might have like a plant or something that's fine for that, but it's not going to make enough quantity to dye anything. And then we can't, uh, you can't be shipping um, seeds internationally because that's against, you know, yeah. laws. No, for sure. <laughs> and then uh, we showed a, one of your little cuties. Uh, one of your kids planting the seeds with your husband and then yeah. uh, using yellow, the outside of the rice husk um, mm -hmm. as a way to do mulching or to help the soil. Uh, yeah, I think it's just to keep the moisture in or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> and then when you harvest the leaves, uh, you dry them out and then you keep them in bags to ferment them. Is that right? Uh, not quite. So the process of harvesting, we harvest a branch um and then they go in a chopping machine which chops them up small and then the stalks drop down because they're heavy and the leaves are light so they get blown away with um lots of uh fans electric fans and then the dried leaves are laid in the sun for about a day and because it's hot japanese summer they dry quite quickly they become crispy and they go from a light green yellow green into a bluish green color and then we collect those dried leaves uh until the autumn yeah they look like that one's not quite finished got a little bit of green in it um uh we leave the dried leaves in bags until autumn harvest three times over the summer that's a lot of bags yeah maybe like 70 70 or 80 bags of dried leaves and they after they're fermented they became eight i think bags of Sukumo and a sukumo is the stuff which you can uh, dye with. So it's like 10 to 1. Uh, yes, that's a fermenti. fermenting, fermenting water and dried leaves. Water and dried leaves mixed together. And uh, every four days we add a little bit of dried leaves and water and mix it, which is pretty hard work. And that takes a traditionally 100 days. But it's basically from like September to the end of the year. And then um, the fermentation is finished. And then we're going to leave those, let those bags of sukumo rest for about six months. And then we can use them to dye something. So the whole process takes a year and a half from a seed to dye. Wow. Uh, I remember doing an indigo workshop. And that's one of the things that you guys offer. Uh, yes. In the shop. Um, and they were very careful about washing the cotton materials before putting it in and how uh, they think of the, the vat of fermented dye as a living thing, like it changes all the time. You mentioned that on your website too, right? Yeah, it's not just thinking of it as a living thing. It is a living thing. It's got, um, <laughs> it's got uh, microbes, a microbial community in it, which is like uh, consuming the oxygen. And uh, that's, it means it's reduced is the word they use so it doesn't have oxygen and when it's in a deoxygenated state that's when you can dye clothes that's when the um it will attach to the fabric then when you take the fabric out of the dye bath uh the oxygen from the air or oxygen from water changes the color from uh kind of brownish yellowish green into blue and that process is repeated maybe up to like 20 times, gradually getting darker and darker. 
It's so beautiful. Um, yeah. You have a shop of things that you've dyed and sell, as well as uh, for the workshops, you can offer fresh materials that people can dye, mm -hmm. or they can bring old clothes or old materials yep. that they can make new, refresh, yeah. reuse. I love it. Yeah, so we do, um, you can do mochikomi, bring your own stuff. Or sometimes we just have people like drop off their clothes that they want us to dye for them. So we can do that too. Yeah, it's a really nice way to um, keep your clothes like without having to throw them away. Yeah. Beautiful. And I've, I've heard that there's antibacterial uh, aspects of indigo as well. Yeah. Of, right? Yeah, I'm not an expert about it, but yes, they do say that. I feel like they get a little bit less smelly if you're wearing them a lot. And um, yeah, and they're good. They're, people say it's good for like eczema skin and stuff. So um, yeah, uh, one of our kids has uh, eczema, so he's always wearing the indigo pants. <laughs> Wow, that's awesome. I, I love it myself. This is something I did at a workshop years ago oh. uh, to refresh an old scarf. And it has like color variation. It's not perfectly done, but I, I love it. I wear it all the time. Oh, um, nice. Yeah, I love that idea of reusing things, slow fashion. Mm -hmm. uh, how do we use textile? We know textile, the fast fashion is such a horribly unsustainable industry yeah and so it's it's so nice to have this concept right yeah i like to um i like to encourage that darning as well i make this like a darning set with the indigo um threads so that you can like if you've got holes in your clothes you can like get the patch and um, stitch it on practice some um sashiko stitching slow slow stitching is pretty slow process but i think it's meditative i love that sachiko yeah. is is a, like a traditional stitching style and so if you yeah. dye the threads um that's another way to repair and use your clothes longer and yeah. it looks it looks really cool and i saw on your website you said you don't need to be an expert person at sewing anybody can do it, it just takes time right yeah yeah there's um yeah just accept the the beginner speed is okay i think <laughs> now on your your website you also introduce the look of your shop it's so colorful and cute yeah. uh, did you. you do that yourself yeah i painted it um i like to paint big things if i get a chance um so yeah the scaffolding was up to fix the cracks on the wall so i couldn't i couldn't resist <laughs> So when you're when you're looking for a house or a building to make your business, do you look for something that you could transform or you could color uh, or it just happened that way? It was I think it was just a coincidence this time. But yeah, if anyone has any spare walls, um, I'm always there. To, That's uh, fantastic. To now, one of my favorite backdrops that I always use for my show is a colored uh, indigo dyed noren yeah. curtain. And I saw that you have a lot of beautiful noren yeah. in your shop as well. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's my husband's design, that one. Yeah. Oh, that's just gorgeous. And then uh, another thing which I love to promote more in Japan, I would love to see it come back, is furoshiki. Oh, the yeah. We use gift wrapping. Yeah. Um, I remember years ago being given a beautiful gift in Fudoshiki and I was like, oh my God, I love the wrapping. Yeah. And my friend said, oh no, the wrapping's coming back with me. That's my <laughs> Fudoshiki. And I was a bit, whoa, but then I love it now. So I do the same. And then if you want to gift the Fudoshiki, you can yeah. as well. Um, yeah. But that's another great design. Uh, is this one of yours or your partner's? Yeah, yeah I made that one. Yeah, they, it's really nice the way when you wrap it, the petals come like around the um, whatever you put inside the box or whatever. Yeah. Oh, that's gorgeous. Yeah, I like it when people bring them on like a picnic or something like that. So cute. Oh, it's perfect. And I, I often suggest it to businesses um, that are selling such high quality items, mm -hmm. especially artisan craftsman items. Mm -hmm. Instead of a plastic bag, I always say, please use fudoshiki. Like it would really elevate 
yeah. the experience and the visitor watching you wrap it in yeah. Furoshiki is part of the added value, you know? So I, I would love to see it come back for shops too. Yeah, I feel like in Japan, if that happened, if you wrapped it in a beautiful Furoshiki, the person would then want to wrap that in a in a bag. <laughs> That well, would be I, style. right, yeah, I get that. Um, but I was, I was suggesting like they have their brand name on it on oh, their yeah. so you could make you know simple ones. It, it's better than plastic bags. Let's just yeah, get sure. away from plastic bags, right? Yeah, bring your own bag. Mm. Now we talked a little bit about sashiki. Uh, uh, this is also weaving. Is it? Can you explain uh -huh. what's happening here? Um, yeah, so I haven't done so much recently. Uh, sometimes I do actually. Yeah, the um, the the little drawing at the bottom is a is a backstrap loom. So you 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 use the like tension of your body instead of the frame of a big loom to just make sm small things. Yeah, like a, like an earring. I made these little earrings small bits of fabric it's also very slow well, those are gorgeous yeah and then uh one of the other techniques that you seem to use a lot is is it called itajime 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 is one of the kinds of shibori so there's many many ways to make patterns on fabric with stitching with um wooden blocks so yeah itajime is with a wooden block so you could make like um like this one. Sorry, I'm running away. Like this. That's made with itajime. Um, it's folded into triangles, this triangle, and then use a wooden block to hold the shape. And basically with the shibori, any part that you're like concealing inside, hiding is gonna stay white. And then the bit that's on the outside becomes blue generally speaking <laughs> and then yeah there's there's so many different ways to do it there's like stitching there's um this is a stitch that's a stitch yeah oh that's beautiful you can be as creative as you like and then there's like methods which patterns which are um kind of traditional always not i don't know traditional traditionally shaped ones and then there's ones which you can be like a little bit more creative and write and like make them a bit newer yeah and then if you uh on a workshop like if you want to do something really simple or if it's kids there's loads of things you can do just with like folding and elastic bands and uh, uh, what's it called? Clothes pegs or things like that. Yeah. Wow. Great. Uh, some of the needlework, it looks like you do by hand and then others uh, you're using a machine so you can do either. Is that right? Yeah. I, there's not so much you can, there's not so many you do with a machine, but that one. Yeah. Recently we tried, that's what I just showed you this one. Um, we'd used a machine. Yeah. Do you find it? Do you like one or the other? Is the hand sewn a bit nicer, or you you like both, or it's mm. just a nice option? Yeah, I like both. Um, it's I think it's easier by hand in a way. It's just slower. It's just slow. It just takes a long time. <laughs> Some things take a long time, and then you can't always tell um, unless you know like which patterns took a long time and which patterns are actually pretty easy. <laughs> That's interesting. And then is this one of the folded ones? Um, yeah, I think that's a hand stitched folded one. Yeah. Gorgeous. Um, another interesting project uh, product that you had is the money envelopes. I love this idea. Yeah. Right. <laughs> it's Usually like it's like for special occasions, you'll buy a, a money envelope. Uh, take it with you when you go to a party um, but why not use one that could be reused is it like a furoshiki flat material um, inside yeah it's just like a little hankachi size maybe about 20 centimeter square fabric um, that you can use um, yeah it's like a little cloth 
so it's reusable. Yeah, I didn't invent the concept, but yeah, I just uh, made an indigo version. And then because I do the, um, I've just been fiddling with this as we talk, uh, the Mizuhiki as well. Mizuhiki is um, it's like a paper cord and it's it's wrapped, well, the ones that I use are wrapped in like a natural fiber, which means that you can dye it. So um, yeah, I dye them and then uh, knot them. It's knot work, that's what it is in English. <laughs> Nice. And then yes, it's hard to remember the English terms for these. Two, right? yeah. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. So the um, this knot actually is called Awaji Musubi. So it's good for us because we're on Awaji Island. So I like to use it for like souvenirs and stuff. But um, it has a meaning as well in Japanese because it's um, as you pull it, it gets tighter and you can't undo it. So it's for occasions which are. Um, you only want to do once, like get married. Ideally, you only want to get married once. Ah, uh, very so if, nice. you, if you're giving a gift, like for someone who's had a baby, you don't want to give them this one because it means they can only have one baby. They can't do it again. Oh, these are these are faux pas, easy to fall into. Yeah, yeah. But I think a lot of people, Japanese people don't know that. <laughs> um, they sometimes seem surprised. But... Oh, well, since we're in your shop right now, can you introduce like your earrings, introduce some of the products around you? Uh-huh. Should I move the computer? Or okay. you could just bring it, whichever is easier. Um, okay, let's have a look. Oh, here's some weaving on the wall that I did um, with a, like a, what's it called? Uh, like a rag rug method, sakiyori, it's called. Like a bits of leftover fabric. Yeah. Are, um, woven and then this is down here is some jewelry with like a mizuhiki and a weaving so this is like a ume um what's it called plum blossom <laughs> that's the word but all of them come from um awaji musubi actually the the first knot you do is awaji musubi and then you can like make it into a plum blossom or into a ball and this is made of lots of awaji musubi as well. It's not a good view. Um, lots of awaji musubi together. To That's make beautiful. Ball. Yeah, and then I have a teacher, uh, Mizuhiki Dai Sensei, in the local shopping arcade, in the uh, who taught me how to do the knot work. And she really wants to like just promote the uh, Mizuhiki generally. So she's happy that I'm doing it. Um, in indigo yeah then what else is there to see um, i love your dyed hands too oh, yeah. is, that, is that like a point of pride like if you're mm -hmm. walking around japan and people see that they know that you're doing indigo dye right a lot of people would say that yeah i prefer it to like um comments about like having white skin or something which under like as you know like make me feel uncomfortable but Japanese people think it's like a praise thing. Oh, your skin's so white. Anyway, but if you have blue hands, um, they'll be like, oh, you've got blue hands. And they forget about me being white. So I prefer it because then we can talk about indigo, which is something I care about rather than like the DNA, which made me white. Anyway. I love that. It's like no longer how, how many years I've been here, almost 30. I always look like a visitor, right? Yeah. So if you wear like indigo scarves or you show something that shows you're here. Yeah. So I, I love that idea, the blue hands too. Great. Yeah, it's, it's something I'm always happy to talk about indigo. That's a much yeah. more interesting topic to me than. Um, Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, yeah, London or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> so. And those yeah. are your tote bags, are they? Are yeah, they this is an example of like a really simple pattern because it's just made with uh, little clips. Just fold and clip, and anyone can do that. Or this is with um elastic band. And then this one shows like the the colors. So like part of what makes indigo and shibori a good set together is um the that uh, indigo has like such a big range of blue colors from like the really light light blue to like a really dark dark blue, and that means that like there's just so many ways to express like um like a black and white photograph like you can really have all the range which is more than like other uh, natural dyes like some other natural dyes which don't ha have that variation 
I saw that you were also trying different colors and different natural dyes. Um, oh, yeah, that's just Yellows a little... and pink and stuff just to try it. Yeah. What would you call that? Med med meddling? Uh, just uh, just uh, having a little go. Yeah. It's just for fun. But that pink is amazing. It's so exciting. That yeah, is amazing. What was that from? Safflower. Ben Benny Banner. Is that what it's called? Yeah, I think so. so like the main color it makes is yellow, but if after you've drained all the yellow from it, you can get this amazing pink. And then um, this is a great color. It's also from indigo, but using uh, um, fresh leaves. Fresh, not fresh, yeah, yeah. Fresh, not, um, not sycamore. So it's quite simple. And uh, it, this is what I would recommend, or this one, if you're gonna do like, just grow some seeds in a planter, um, and you don't have enough to make sycamore because you need like a lot to make sycamore. But if you just get the leaf and just hit it with a hammer onto co cotton fabric, you can make like fun patterns. So oh, I that's awesome. that, like for kids or anyone who's a kid at heart. And <laughs> um, but this color works best on the silk. So um, as you probably are aware, like there's lots of, like rolls and rolls of white silk, which people would have used for the linings of kimono. And they're just like sitting in store cupboards and not being used and getting like, um, t what, what would you call it? Like tarnished, like little brown dots and stuff. And they're just going to waste. So like I, I have a couple of sources of like uh, older ladies who are like, do you want this silk? Have this silk, white silk. And then um, we can dye it with a fresh leaves and it's That's like beautiful such a high um high value material yes it's right? so expensive if you want to buy some silk so and japan has a long history of like silk silk mm -hmm. production right like i'll i'll often i'll visit old houses and they'll have uh areas where they used to keep the silkworms or you yeah. know like the production was a, a big part of japan's japan's history right yeah yeah um yeah and then it just it makes me sad when it's just like going to waste or people don't know what to do with it and like the older generation they like have that um motai nai, uh feeling like they don't want to they know it's valuable they don't want to get rid of it but that's great that they do right yeah. we we all need to have that more yeah um yeah fantastic uh, so talking more about like color variation, you had one example also, a yellow to green. Is this then with indigo as well? Oh, yeah. So the, it was just originally it was that yellow color and then it had like a stain on the back from like bleach or something. It would have gone a bit weird. So my um, customer wanted to like dye it. So when you put the blue overlaid on the mustard color, it made that nice green. That's yeah. beautiful. What variation. And then this one uh, you said was done by a German uh, guest at your <laughs> workshop. They're beautiful work. Yeah, that's the stitching takes a really long time. She actually, she was a professional. She makes costumes for like an opera or something. So she knew what to do with a needle. But um, I think still any, like you could do that. Anyone could do that really, if you have enough time. <laughs> I'm not sure I could do it, but it was beautiful to see. Um, and then basically the the fermentation, the, the what are the ingredients? Can okay. you explain this? Yeah. We talk about making a vat. Okay, so um we've we've done the bit where you make a bag of sukumo, and then we have um 300 liters, is that right? 300 liters um vat. And we're going to get one sack, which is about 30 kilograms of sycamore, and pour on a really hot um, aku, which is uh, ash water. It's high alkali water. So we pour the hot. And that's made with ash, is it? Yeah, just ash and boiling water. And then it raises the pH up to, to like uh, 11 or up to 12. And it needs massaging for a couple of hours to kind of waken it up. So when the sukumo is just in a bag, you can keep it like that for years. It's kind of in a sleeping state. So we need to uh, restart the fermentation and get the 
microbes, microbial community up and running. So we uh, massage the sycamore with the aku and then uh, put it in the vat. And then um, after about maybe five days, the color starts, um, the color will start showing and we're going to add like a little bit more aku and more aku and um, then maybe we can use it. But yeah, it's a bit complicated, sorry. That's okay. Once you make once you make your vat, how long can you use it? Is there an expiry, like a short life, or you can um, use it for a long time? Maybe like um ideally over a year, but it sometimes in reality only about three months. So it depends like how well we can take care of it and how much we've been using it. Um the color will start off usually starts off pretty like nice and dark and rich and gradually over time it gets lighter and lighter but there are some points where it gets lighter and then gets darker again and then gets lighter and darker again and there's a couple of things there's a few things that we can do to uh keep it maintain it healthily so um every day or so we're gonna like mix it like a witch like this and uh to like get it moving around then uh to feed the <clears throat> microbes we can add uh like fusuma porridge like um wheat bran porridge that's like a carbohydrates or something i don't know um and then they're gonna like be more genki alive and we can also raise the ph with a uh, kaibai which is um shell lime I think that was one of the first ingredients, right? Can you explain the ingredients? So on the left of the picture here, you have the indigo, right? Yep, that's sycamore. And, and then, then above the it? The second one is um, ash? the ash water. And then the third one is the uh, wheat, uh, wheat bran porridge. And then the fourth one is the shell lime. And so, all of these you can you can get from Japan quite cheaply, right? Uh, the indigo yeah. is probably the hardest to get, right? Yeah, yes, it is. But yeah, I mean, there's different recipes. There's different, like each um, Aizome studio, indigo studio is going to have their own like way of doing things. And I don't think there's like the purest or most true way or anything. Just everyone's got their own way. Like you should mix it then. You shouldn't mix it after you add this, blah, blah, blah. Is it very precise, like you have to have the exact measurements right? Or is it kind of you do it, you get a... No, I think it's it? more like a cooking, like where you just add a bit of a pinch of salt and you smell it and um, test it and like add a bit more. It's not like a following, a, it's that kind of intuitive cooking rather than the recipe following cooking, I think. You just put, <laughs> you just put your finger in your mouth, so do you also taste it? Actually, I don't, but some people do. <laughs> I, I could imagine some people tasting it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because you're testing for the pH. And when you feel it, it feels a little bit slimy, like soap. And yeah, you, you're going to check the the color that it's giving onto fabric, but also the surface. Uh, how does it appear? Like, is it got like a purplish metallic shine? That's a good thing. Um, how is the smell? Is it like really ammonia smell? Is it like a little bit fruity? Um, and also the temperature affects it a lot as well. So in the winter, we warm it up, keep it warm with an electric heater. But in the summer, it's generally okay. Apart from in our location about sometimes it gets a bit too hot, like above 30, some 34 or something is too hot in the room. Um, then the color goes weaker, but then it, usually, it comes back um, after that. So there's a lot of variations. Also, the, how much you've used it. Like if you dyed it a lot, it might just be tired the next day like anyone. Interesting. It really is alive. Yeah. Um, is, it, is it possible for you to, to have workshops or be using Indigo all year? Or is there certain seasons which are easier? Uh, no, you can, we can do workshops all year because we heat them in the winter and um, yeah, all year round. 
That's wonderful. And like uh, many traditional cultures in Japan, the fermented uh, indigo dye, right? The fermentation is such a big part of yeah. Japanese culture. Do you do you find it easier to to do that in an area where other people are fermenting things like miso or soy sauce or sake? Do you have any other fermenters around you? Um, that's an interesting point, but yeah, no, I should make friend like to learn more about fermentation, which is often something I think like, I don't know what's going on. I should, I need to learn more. Yeah. I should be talking to the, to the, the beer guys down the road. Yeah. I will do that now, but that uh, is, I don't think that's nice collaborate too, right? Between the, what is it called in Japanese? Hakko fermentation. Hakko. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hakko community. No, there's, there is an indigo community and like, um, in around here so yeah i know various people like dyeing and or like weaving or whatever um knitting with indigo make grow and farmers as well but um yeah i need to get with the the soy sauce and the kimchi and the beer guys you're right <laughs> That would be nice. And then if you even had your, your flyers at each other's shops, because yes. like, I think visit customers are also interested in sure. all the fermentation yeah. connections, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, that's that's next next project. Let's get on it. All right, good. Um, I just want to point out some of the other interesting products you have or techniques. Um, is there anything we haven't really mentioned yet? Uh, yeah. Um, how about like a um, pigment and a, like a paint? Because uh, so we do the main thing we're doing is the Sukumon dyeing fabric, which is like cotton or linen. But um, there's another process called chinden ai, which is uh, the way they do it in Okinawa. Uh, they have a different plant in Okinawa and a different process to extract the indigo for dyeing and painting. And uh, around the world, they have different plants that uh, make indigo and most of them do like a variation on the uh chindenai which is i think you call it water extraction method so like just put their fresh leaves in a lot of water and like warm it or if it's the summer just leave it and um eventually well, there's various process but eventually the the indigo pigment sinks to the bottom and you siphon off the top liquid and then you're just left with like pure blue color and then uh at our studio we dry it out and then you can grind it and make paint with that and um yeah that's something i want to do more of my oh yeah <laughs> we also is this how you use the paint is this how <laughs> you could use it this is awesome i love this face paint we just did it yeah that one time for an event at the at the a uh, uh, local place because they asked us to do something fun so we tried making face paint I'm not really a face paint expert but yeah we just used like a what's it called cold cream and our pigment and um yeah tried to make face paint that's awesome <laughs> because I I let my hair grow out and it's very gray I often think wouldn't it be great to have indigo inside like hair wax or something so you oh. could have a little bit of blue color you don't want it every day but you can use indigo to dye your hair you can you can i, I love that idea oh well um yeah there's um there we do have a uh, our flyers in a local hair salon that does like uh dyeing with a uh, henna and indigo so um you should go there nice well it's a, a little bit far for me but maybe <laughs> maybe i can talk to you later and we'll try to work <laughs> But but do you also like what you used for the face paint that dried indigo? Yeah, is that's... that is that possible to buy that from you? And then people could try different um, things like hair wax or it's really paint. We we haven't sold it yet. It's really expensive. <laughs> so because it's um, condensed and concentrated version. Yeah, it's right? just pigment. It's um oh, I it's, can imagine. It's a lot of leaves to like get the pigment out so at the moment we're just using it for our own artistic purposes yeah um, yeah no I understand yeah. I'd love to see it in all stores because it, <laughs> it's the cycle like from seed to the end of life it's that sustainable we have so few very sustainable made in Japan ingredients and things like that yeah. so I, I just love to see it everywhere it's awesome yeah thank you the color this um 
this uh, poster I made, it has the the pigment paint. I use the pigment paint to not to print the poster, but just to draw it. And the color is like a little bit different. I don't know if you can really see. Oh, it's it's beautiful. Little, yeah, it's very simple. A greenish color. Um, it comes out rather than like the same as the fabric. Oh, yeah, that's. Um, you did like a watercolor with natural dyes. Yeah. Workshop. Yeah, I'd like to do more of that too. It's fun. Um, yeah, I've got some very a few pigments that uh, we're developing in development. Awesome. So what's the more like difficult of the techniques? You mentioned gradation is quite difficult, is it? Um, I guess so, yeah. It depends how refined you want to be about it. So like if you're happy to have, um, yeah, to get it really smooth is quite hard. But fun yeah so like this is this t-shirt this dyed t-shirt is this gradation yeah that is a gradation but the that's the our customer made that one by herself under my instruction so she could do it that was her first time it was fine beautiful yeah that's awesome and then this this style we haven't really talked about yet you said this was very time time sensitive time yeah, time consuming. <laughs> it's not time to stitch. Like, um, yeah, it's called a Hinode Shibori, so it's like a sunrise. Nice. Uh, because uh, it's going to be like when it's stitched and folded, it's a semicircle like this. Um, yeah, uh, it takes a long time, but it's beautiful. Often the ones that have a lot of white in are more difficult not always really Which is yeah. oh at the end product having white end yeah know? like it's a high contrast between like white and um yeah and dark blue that's because um, how do you keep it out of the dye that must be the challenging part right yeah yeah <laughs> i guess so yeah oh beautiful um now one thing we haven't talked about uh yet which is of course a major part of traditional indigo for jeans. Um, oh, yeah. Now, you've got an example here of how, I guess, acid wash was an 80s trend. Um, yeah. Take it back to the deep indigo blue. I love that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think uh, our orig the original jeans would have been dyed with natural indigo, but now if you try and buy natural indigo jeans, it's pretty expensive. <laughs> um, the... Traditionally, you dye the thread and then weave them. So ours are obviously dyed after the product is made. So it looks a bit different, but um, yeah, they they feel good. They look good. <laughs> sure. Yeah, beautiful. And then you also extend the life of the product. Um, yeah, those those right. stonewash jeans that you showed was like um, a, an older guy. He brought them in. So I I was yeah. He said he'd had them probably. A long time. I can't remember how many times, but yeah, at least a couple of decades he's had those jeans. So. Which is awesome because you it's almost like having a brand new pair that you yeah. can enjoy. And it fits you better because it's your old jeans, which is yeah. fabulous. You no, know it fits. That's a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> Have you done other things like shoes? Like if it's if it's sneakers or something? Mm -hmm. They they we've tried, but um it's quite hard. I wouldn't say it's something that we can do. Because we've tried and failed. Is there any other like things you've tried, but that doesn't really work or? Um, there's lots of things. There's so many. The thing about Indigo is like, there's so many things like I want to try and want to get good at. And there's, there's not really enough time. So yeah, uh, shoes is one that is a bit hard or it's possible, but especially if you use um, uh, like a canvas shoe, I'm sure I could do that if I really wanted to. But leather is hard because i know it's possible but i don't know how to do it it's because like the ph and also getting it wet uh, it's just it's hard and also my um a leather is it doesn't really appeal to me anyway but yeah. sometimes we get asked have you done any collaborations with businesses that are making things like for example a shoe company might ask you to dye it before they make the shoe oh or yeah like um we have there's not i don't know uh 
It's one that I can't talk about yet. <laughs> and top uh, secret, very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Um, sometimes we outsource like our uh, hats, uh, just ask the hat lady to make our, our hats. So I didn't make the hats, these hats. We just dyed the fabric and then we ask her to make them. That's very cute. I like it. She's got a special machine. I did try to make a hat on my reg, like really basic sewing machine and it was really hard, but I did, I could do it. But, um, if you've got the proper equipment, it's definitely easier. Yeah, I think um, Clementine, who does Mikan Bag, oh, yeah. she she talked about making hats and she's like, I don't make the hats, but, you know, I'll do the material for the person who makes the hats. So you can't do everything like no. you're specializing, you know, that's the way to do it. <laughs> yeah, definitely. It's good. Sometimes it's good to delegate. Yeah. And running your own shop and workshops and being working parents, are you able to find work-life balance? Everything going going okay, or you can be more flexible because you're working for yourself, right? Yeah, I mean, it's it's great that I can be flexible, and um, yeah, if my daughter is needs to stay home from her kindergarten, then I'm here. It's fine. So, yeah. But it is hard to, it is hard to balance, but um, I'm there. I'm balancing. Good. You're doing it. Yeah. It's all an adventure, life adventure. It's the way to do it. Yeah. <laughs> now, uh, I'm going to show your website. And if you uh, can tell us, like, how people would sign up for uh, workshops and what, what they need to think about or how long it takes, that kind of thing. Okay, sure. Um, it, if you want to do a workshop, you can contact us from um, Instagram or from the online form on our website. And uh, at the moment, it's still um, just mostly talking about the, the basic kind of, well, standard workshop. But if you really want to do like the deeper, like take longer to do more slow stitching, um, there's some more information that I can send to you directly. So just ask for it um, because there's like a little bit different price if you're going to do like intensive, serious shibori. Um, and then if you want to bring your own stuff today, there's a few things to consider, which is the main thing is the, in, what's it called? Not ingredients. What the thing is made of. Is it made of cotton or linen? Because those are the, <clears throat> the ones that dye best. Um, polyester can't be dyed. And uh, yeah, other natural fibers can be dyed, but I would really prefer just to do cotton and linen. How about um, silk? Silk is, difficult. it does dye, but it's a bit difficult. So I don't recommend and, it. And mixed material items is also difficult, right? It needs to be pure cotton. Well, it can be cotton and linen mix. That's oh, okay. cotton linen. Okay. Yeah. How about things like bamboo cotton? Um, maybe, <laughs> but safest. Yeah, I recommend like if you have a few things to bring, I recommend bring a few things, and then we can decide like decide on the day like which. Because some also, if you want to do a certain pattern, but it doesn't fit on this t-shirt because the sleeves are in the way or something. It's better to have a few different options. And uh, another thing to consider is the um, stitching. Um, I don't know if you can see. This has polyester stitching. Like most things, even if they say 100% cotton, the stitching is still polyester usually, not always. And then it's going to like show up. Um, and like if you have big white buttons on your big white blouse when you dye it it will be like big white buttons unless you change them so you could consider that too and then also <clears throat> the things that dye better are ones that have been washed a lot of times so like if you buy like a brand new tote bag it actually has like um some kind of waterproof coating on it and it won't dye well at all you, often not always so you can test the fabric by if you just get your clothing or fabric and then put a drop of water on it does the drop of water absorb in or is it just sitting on the surface if it's just sitting on the surface it might be difficult to dye because it's got that like coating on it it's 
kind of stain proof. I think they do it to like make white things stain proof, but yeah. it also means you can't. Die. There's there's a lot of waterproofing, and then that makes you worry about is it PFAS? Is it natural yeah. coating? Right? You don't want to put that in your living indigo dye vat. That's for sure. Yeah, and then also I would say if you if you for example if you're on holiday and then you come to japan and then you want to come here you can go to like a second hand shop to look for some white clothes and then they've probably been washed before and they're second hand so i recommend that too do you have a favorite second hand shop second street <laughs> you can find some great sizes and great variety of things at second street there's also book off all over oh, the yeah. country, right we don't, we don't have that on this island but we do have second street so i recommend okay. second street. So if you go and you you didn't bring anything, you could go nearby to Second Street and choose something. That would be yeah. fun. Yeah, that's what I recommend. <laughs> you could make it a tour, go together and do both. Yeah. <laughs> if you have time, of course. Yeah. But Awaji Island also, it's like, um, I do recommend it because it's a little bit off the beaten track, but it's pretty accessible. There's no train, which people get a bit mm, about, but there's like a highway bus, which is, comes directly and it stops like 10 minutes from my house and then you're in like the proper countryside so it's it's really I think people should get away from like the big cities more come to try like some rural hundred uh, hundred we've got beach, yes we've got mountains we've got fields we've got indigo it's, it's like you should come to Awaji it looks beautiful I mean look at this family photo on your website yeah. it just looks amazing is that at Awaji Island that beautiful sea yeah. behind you yeah Fantastic. Uh, <laughs> why why go to the same places everybody's going? There's so yeah. many more places to explore. Yeah. Awaji Island being one of them. Now here uh, you talk about how many people you could take at one time. So you say six and yeah. children can join if they're with the family. Is that right? Yeah. Um, I I recommend the workshop for like five, like five years and above and less than five years old. Like there's only so much they can do. They're welcome to come, but um, usually the little kids that are brought here, it's like the parents who want to do it. And then like the three-year-old is like, mm -hmm. yeah, it doesn't really just happen. dipping and that's waiting. What? <laughs> that's not fun. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but older kids might get a, a lot out of it. And oh yeah. Happy with what I they mean, had, right? Yeah. It's science, culture, art, everything hands-on. Yeah. It's got it all. So. Good That's kids. great. And I saw uh, some of your Google business reviews and it looks like people really appreciate your teaching and your patience. So you're a good teacher. Did you do some teaching in Japan as well before this? Um, I just, the yeah, as little as possible because I wasn't really into it. Well, yeah, being a, being a mom and an artist. Yeah. Uh, we didn't talk about how you and your partner met at a Z Fest. I love that story. <laughs> Yeah, also Z. Z Fair 2011. Yeah, that's amazing. I love yeah. it. Oh, I did. Um, I did want to say that I have taught other things. Like I, I'm not so much into the English, but I did teach um some art in England, art classes, and I taught at this really cool place that was like a blind care home, and we did like uh, tactile crafts for blind people. That was really fun. So I do have, I do like teaching. I'm just not destined to be an English teacher. Yeah, no, no, we don't all have to be English mm -hmm. teachers. Uh, we need variety and diversity in Japan. That's for sure. <laughs> um, is there anything coming up this year that you'd like to tell us about? Or you have workshops or events coming up or people can book work workshops anytime? Yeah, people can book workshops anytime. And then... Um, that yeah i guess we're coming up to like uh the busiest season of the farming so i'll be taking care of the fields and far, uh harvesting drying and all of that stuff um and if people want like really interested in that too they can um try and schedule to come but it is a bit tricky because it all just depends on the weather so like i can't say like i will be harvesting on this day until right like before the day because uh, it's just it all depend on the weather. Yeah, for sure. I mm -hmm. understand that. Well, thank you so much for joining and for giving us all these insights about running a indigo workshop and shop and as an artist. And I've put all your links below and I really hope people get in touch. Uh, it was great talking with you. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Thank you so much, Sally. Thanks everyone for joining. And as always, if you didn't ask a question or comment, but you want to, uh, you can write it below and uh, we'll make sure and get back to you. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks, Sally. Thank you. Goodbye.